Welcome to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, Kel and O'Brien. Kel's 23, joining Team Bike Exchange, I believe, on a two-year deal. Uh, formerly a track rider, he won uh, well, world, champion, world champion in the Team Pursuit all the way back in 2017, and then recently third in the Team Pursuit at the Tokyo Olympic Games. That's what I wanted to talk about first, Kel. Because of the delay of the Olympics, did that delay, like, was this always the plan for you to go to World Tour, you know, straight after Tokyo? And did the delay effectively push that back a year for you as well? Yeah, I think uh, always for me, the plan was to um, get onto the road uh, once my Olympic ambitions were over. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, would, I was always planning to go onto the road, but maybe the extra year sort of gave me a bit more time to sort of, build up my endurance, I guess, and um, actually be ready to, to turn, go into the, into the world tour after Tokyo. So it didn't delay anything for me. I think it just gave me a bit more time. Yeah. And for this is a road cycling, mainly podcast. Could you explain to people maybe your role in the, the team pursuit team, what sort of like physical requirements there are, how you maybe differ to someone like Wellsford or, or Lee Howard in, in that setup? Um, yeah, okay. So the team pursuit is uh, it's a four kilometre race, so fairly short uh, in comparison to, to road cycling. Um, it's very high power, very, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an, essentially it's a, it's a long drawn out sprint really. Um, I think uh, for me, my role sort of um, gets split up between the the back end roles of the of the event. Um, Wellsford is um, one of our fastest guys, and he he always finishes strong. So uh, we team up quite well in in the in the back end together. Um, but uh, over the years, for me in the team pursuit, the my role has sort of changed. Like I. Um, I ride most of the wheels, first, second, third, fourth wheel. Um, and I guess that's sort of what I brought to the team was a bit of like, you know, if something went wrong for someone and they couldn't, um, you know, they got sick or injured, then um, I could fill in those shoes. Have you still got the blonde hair? Is that why the beanie's on? Have you still got the, the blonde hair? No, 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 no. Cut it all off, eh? <laughs> but uh, no, it's just cold over here now. <laughs> yeah. So where are you? Are you in Girona or in Europe at the moment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm in Girona at the moment. Um, yeah, but it's it's nice and cold, that's for sure. <laughs> I'll put up some. Yeah, I mean, Kel's been playing. I'll put up some photos for the video version of uh, I'm in Andorra, where I think you're coming soon, and it's beyond cold. There's like a, f- a knee deep <laughs> snow outside my house now, so uh, Girona doesn't look as bad. It looks great to me actually. Um, but so you are continuing doing some track work now you're doing the uh uci track champions league you've done six day in the past this seems to be like a competitor to the six day competition which is like a track events in the off season which can get some of the road guys doing it like the Viviani cavendish Merku you've seen before the uci track champions league i think gets rid of the madison and it's like a different format How's that been for you, the different format, having done both the six-day and the track Champions League? For spe- spectator-wise, it's better. I prefer the track Champions League because I hate watching Madison. I can't understand what's going on. But as a competitor, what's it been like? Oh, it's been it's been good. Yeah, obviously, it um, clashes a little bit with the six-day season, um, which it's been a little bit of a shame to see uh, a lot of the six days sort of fall away since the pandemic. but um uh, the program is is very, very different like it's a super short condensed three hour program um in terms of endurance events they're like you know one five minute race and another 12 minute race or 15 minute race or whatever so they're pretty short um it's a lot of like travel and then like unpacking bikes and getting ready for a, a pretty short evening of racing but it's super exciting and luckily like the crowd has been really, really good at these events. And I think it's, it's taken off well. And I guess, like you say, it's, it's pretty easy to follow. Um, You know, it's just a short series of, you know, five weekends of racing. Um, You accumulate points and whoever's on top of the end, you know, wins. And, um, but yeah, I mean, in comparison, it's it's so different to the six days, but 
it's been really good, I think, to, to get it off the ground this year and hopefully next year will be a bit better again. Our Antipodine uh, compatriot, Corbin Strong, has been doing pretty well at it. How do you reckon he's at Israel in three years? Like, it seems a lot of the Australians don't, or a new Kiwis don't get huge hype like uh, maybe an Italian or a Spanish guy. How do you reckon he's 21? Do you reckon he's ready to be competitive at like some of those Italian 1-1 sprints that Caden's been doing? Like, what do you think for Corbin? Because he's been doing well at the track. Yeah, for sure. He's, um, I think he's a, a, an understated talent for sure. I mean, I think you sometimes can forget just how young um, some people are. I mean, you know, we have so many super talents now on the road that are so young. Um, and, and he's no exception. I think like he's 21, he's just signed for three years with a, with an awesome team and he's going to have a great lead out to be a part of as well. Um, in terms of like the one day races and stuff, I'm not, I mean, I haven't really seen too much of him on the road. Um, but I know that he, he can probably climb a lot better than you would think. Okay. Um, so for sure, like he, he's a pretty lightweight sprinter. So um, I think it'd be very interesting to see like how he handles the load of, of the year as well. Coming from a track background, the endurance load next year will be interesting to see how he, how he handles it. But for sure, he's got, he's got a big punch at the end of races. What are you thinking your role is at Pike Exchange? And I know it's a lead out for Caden. I saw in a press release, but a bit more specific than that. Is it, <clears throat> excuse me, last man, second last man? Because I've seen people that follow the channel for a long time i did a video on kel and wellsford who's going to dsm at the bay crits back in like i can't remember how long ago it was 2020 2019 you guys were on lexus blackburn this is not world tour racing but it was <laughs> there's nothing on in, in december january and you did a lead out for him there when he won i think nick white overcooked the last corner will you be so that was a last man role is that you're a big guy, you got to, you can do a good last 750 metres. Is that where you think you slot in or is it like a Seneschal talking about quick step, second last man ballerini sort of role? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really gotten into much specifics with, with the coaches and stuff like that around that. I'm, and I imagine a bit of that will come down to form. Um, having not raced in the World Tour, I'm not, like, I don't really know where I sit. Um but for sure, naturally for me, like I've been a lead out for, for Wellsford, last man for Wellsford and, and other riders for a few years now. So I think it's somewhere where I'd like to fit in. Um, the last man is, it's, it's, it's a good job and I think I can do it well. Um, but yeah, I suppose it, it, it all depends on how I, how I come into the season. And um, I am looking forward to getting in amongst with the, with the lead out group for Caden and, um potentially some other sprinters as well like um campbell stewart as well another young kiwi guy um he's super super fast definitely underestimated as well what about other guys who are i don't know like jensen Plowright? he's already doing pretty good in some of these sort of u23 races over here do you reckon he's do you expect to see that sort of guy or any, any other names from sort of Australia, New Zealand around the crit scene that you've been around that you think will be in world tour in th two, three, four years? For sure. Jensen's um, definitely got, uh, definitely got something special and hopefully we can see him like in the pro tour. I know he's going to be in Europe um, next year. I think uh, apart from that, there's a few younger guys, um pat eddie i think he might be yeah he's good. um coming over to ride uh with dsm development team maybe something like that um a few few strong guys like that are definitely coming out of australia and hopefully uh, more and more we see them you know in the developing races before world tour as well getting that exposure i reckon we'll see like a few really strong guys come out in the next sort of three years and you're on inform uh, inform TM make uh, or rode for them for a little bit. They seem to be, I think they brought Garen's on as like a development pathway coordinator uh, to be that bridge between an Australian development team or continental team and racing in Europe. Because unfortunately, or just the way it is, 
it's hard to get a world tour contract unless you say Lucas Plapp uh, without some European results or some big track results or uh, bike exchange traditionally have been the team where they are more familiar with the Australians. And so they look at the Australian results a little bit more or, or Berwick or there's the Herald Sun tour where you've got to get a result against the European teams, but without that racing in the last couple of years in Australia, it's been really tough to get exposure. Like what if Berwick had been two years older, there's no Herald Sun tour, Israel don't see him. Like oh, that's the sort of stuff I think about. So Inform doing, seem to be doing a, a pretty good job. But do you know your program for next year yet? Or is that, are, you, are you going on camp in like a week or something where that sort of thing is going to be discussed? Yeah, so I think next week at the team camp, that stuff will um, be discussed and sort of come out a little bit more. I mean, um, like I'm a neo pro, so I don't, you know, I don't want to step on anyone's toes too early and ask the wrong questions. But um, yeah, I think next week I'll have a bit more of an idea, but I guess by the sounds of it, um, it'll be, uh, you know, a Middle East start to the year, um, hopefully in that, in that lead out for the, for the sprint group. What about TT though? I mean, we have spoken a lot about lead out. Surely TT is something that you with the right setup, you're over 190 centimeters. So you can do the extra longer extension. Um, surely are you already, I think got what third at the third at Australian TT champs behind Durbridge, not too far behind. I think you told me last year, you did some obscene 10 minute power, like 500 watts for 10 minutes. It's nothing stupid. Um, is that something you're also going to be focused on as well? Because I reckon, like, you look at, like, like Caden, for example, he won that prologue. There's a lot of those sort of five to 12-minute efforts around the place that unless you're going up against Bissiger and Gana, and Gana, who aren't at those events all the time, I reckon you could be picking up some decent results at those. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Having sat down with the team, um, you know, earlier in the year and discussing like just where my goals are at. It's, it's an area that I haven't really had the time to develop yep. um, because of my Olympic focus, but it's something I'm super passionate about. Um, it's just finding the time and, and the resource to sort of, um, you know, dump everything I can into it. Um, it's definitely up there in my top two priorities for the next two years is, is my time trialing. Um, and like you say, there's, there's plenty of those uh, shorter prologue races or even, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, time trials at Paranese, Torino and stuff like that. They're all, you know, I might not be at those races in the next year or so, but they're definitely big goals for me, for sure. Yeah, like that Paranese one, again, Bissiger, Cavagna, Roglic, like 13, 12, 13 Ks, even Matthews did pretty well. That sort of sort of uh, TT. What you spoke, you sort of alluded to it. What's what do you have to change now? What does a guy going from the track from the Olympic program, what do you have to change to become world tour ready? Or get is it do you have to do any different training to say a normal guy going world tour who's already been racing U23, or is it just simple stuff like just ride your bike for lots of hours in the off season? Yeah, I think um, I think it's a good place to start. Is just you know sit on the saddle for a long periods of time. Um, obviously, like I've trained um, more or less over the years, more and more for shorter efforts. Um, so, like I've trained those training zones, like super high training zones. Anything you know, we're talking like six hundred, seven hundred watts up. Trained those zones a lot, but I haven't really trained the like training zones where you like spend I don't know 90% of the day sometimes in world tour at, you know those lower you know just burning calories all day so for me that's where a lot of it is I need to just be able to like burn calories all day long and then still be able to do those training zones like you know those high yeah. powers at the end of the race so hopefully um yeah just hours on the bike and you know, I'm going to try not to lose too much of, uh, of my muscle mass and weight, um, because my goals, like I still want to do the team pursuit and I still want to do the bunch races on the track, um, for the next few Olympics to come. So I don't really want to like, you know, <laughs> lose all the, all the muscle and all the work that I've done over the last five years. Um, 
so yeah, that, that I mean, that's part of it too, but just hours on the bike, mate. <laughs> yeah. And who do you, uh, when you've had the chance to watch World Tour, which guys do you sort of look at or have you looked at as obviously there's more COVID, et cetera. Do you, you know, when you watch those guys, what do you see them doing as a lead out that people may, may not realize, wow, that's crazy what he just did there. Is it the fact that he's, eating wind for way longer than a an average lead up person can do is it timing what do you see that's kind of special about the top guys like that yeah i mean morkov is like in a league of his own to be fair like his ability like when you watch him lead out he um he's always got space and he always knows where his sprinter is like he doesn't even have to look over his shoulder to know that they're there or not and um when you're in that sort of bubble of the lead out in the last few Ks of a race, it's really hard to get an understanding of what's going on behind you. Um, and yeah, I get, I mean, he's on the track as well. His ability to like create space around himself and always have a way out is insane. And I think like his success in his area has helped that as well, because, you know, you, if you're coming up alongside Morkov, you're going to give him a few extra inches, you know, like, the man's there for business sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for sure. He's a, like just ability to create space is insane. And another different guy, I guess, who's coming up, who I think now is the second best leader man in the world is Jonas Ricker on Alps and Phoenix. They just gave him a four year, I think four or five year extension, which I'd never seen for a lead out man before. Um, and cause he, they basically three guys won races for them. MVP, Merlier and Philipson. And I think Rickart was a big part in, a lot of them he's sort of again i don't know is he, he's a track guy i feel like i've seen rick up doing scratch races before or something like that i don't know but he possible. Like, yeah he sort of similar profile to you maybe a bit shorter he is and yeah just like he's more he'll come from behind and then they just hit with like a really late punch um which i don't know you need you need a lot of power. It's pretty obvious, but when say someone on the left hand, if there's two trains, someone on the left is just holding at 65 Ks an hour. If you're trying to come up five wheel lengths, you need to, the speed you need to go is, you know, a lot faster. And the power to do that is, you know, insane given that when you're already going that fast, it's yeah. To make a difference like that is insane. So he, he always impresses me as well, but I'm keen to see how you guys go. I reckon, Hopefully you and Mez gets, if you guys team up or whoever, I'm keen to see how Caden goes because he's still pretty young and I'm also keen to see how you go in a lot of those, like, I assume, I don't know, what, yeah, you don't know your program yet. I assume you'll do like the sort of Saskatoon, maybe Tour to Hungary uh, sort of sprint, sprint. There's like four sprint stages in those races um, uh, with Caden again next year. But yeah, any, what about sort of, off the bike stuff, logist life logistics, which is often bigger, a bigger deal for the Australians. I know personally moving over to Europe this year. Um, have you been based in sort of Italy, Northern Italy for a while with the track program or how long have you been living in Girona? Are you now sort of out of, after the Olympics fending for yourself entirely? How's that worked in terms of moving from Australia? Yeah, well, I mean, so when I first joined the, the track program, we still had a, a bit of a setup with the, what we call the World Tour Academy on the road, which was based in Italy. Um, and then that sort of got pulled away from, from Australian cycling for the last few years. Um, but yeah, so after I'd, um, I'd sort of had a good summer this year back in Australia, I knew I was going to come to Europe for 2022 and 23. Um, I made the decision to fly straight from Tokyo to Europe, um, having been in Australia for the last two years um, and sort of spend these months setting up my life so that come January 1 or whenever I start racing in January, um, yeah, I'm ready to go. So, yeah, I've been in Girona since the Olympics or since the 9th of August. Um, and... Yeah, so I've set up here and also I'm set up in Andorra now as well. So I'll be up there a bit when I can um, over the next few weeks to get everything ready to go for the for the year. 
Um, but yeah, more or less, we're just sort of fending for ourselves at the moment, setting up and, and getting ready for the next few years. Yeah, I mean, Andorra, I think Court lives here, Asgren lives here, and like I reckon it helps a lot because it's like okay, you can go down to La Soria de Gel down in Spain, and it's you don't have to do hills every day, but definitely it's just you got to go uphill everywhere or downhill everywhere. Although the weather's actually surprising, it's usually pretty good here, but it was good up until now. Um, so I reckon don't be in a rush to come up, come train here now. I think Helsinki and Hague are just literally on turbo train of life at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about going back to Australia if I can <laughs> for, for January because I can't cop it. Uh, I'm not a skier. Like, do, <laughs> do you ski? Are you? I always surprise me seeing world, like world tour riders skiing. I'm like, gee, especially like big, you know, guys on huge contracts. Like, do you ski? Uh, I haven't skied <laughs> since I was maybe 12 or 14. Like we used to go to Mount Otham in the Victorian oh, yeah. Alpine region quite a bit when I was younger, but um, not for a long time. But yeah, it is, it's interesting to see a lot of the pros in the off season. They love uh, going for runs and um, <laughs> going skiing, which is like obviously not the safest of sports to be doing like in the <laughs> some, off season. Some of them shred it too. Like they literally do like backcountry skiing. <laughs> yeah. like, okay uh i mean yeah it, fair enough it's good fitness as well especially that they like the schema here is really really big thanks girl for coming on and being part of the bike exchange preview we'll follow your progress closely next year on bike exchange and, and keen to see how you go so best of luck with that and thanks for joining the lantern rouge cycling podcast thanks mate